I'm Sean Delaney, and you're listening to What Got You There. What Got You There is a must-follow for entrepreneurs, creatives, high achievers, and change makers. Each week, I sit down with some of the world's most influential people and focus on the journey behind their success. We uncover the strategy, tactics, and routines that help them get there. Now it's your journey, so it's time to learn what's going to get you there. What got you there with Sean Delaney? Uh, what got you there with Sean Delaney? What got you there with Sean Delaney? Uh, what got you there with got you got you? What got you there? And as you know, just teaching and coaching, same thing. It's it's one thing to think you know what something means or how to do something. It's a very different different thing to communicate it to get that into the mind of another. And uh, I think teaching instills incredible discipline. You really can't teach something until you understand it, and so you can't fake it. Michael Mobison is one of Sean's favorite authors, thinkers, and investing strategists, and this episode explores the intersection of all of those and so much more. Michael is the author of The Success Equation, Untangling Skill and Luck in Business, Sports, and Investing, Think Twice, Harnessing the Power of Counterintuition, And more than you know, finding financial wisdom in unconventional places updated and explained. Michael has also held roles as director of research at Blue Mountain Capital Management. He was a managing director and head of global financial strategies at Credit Suisse. And he was the chief investment strategist at Leg Mason Capital Management. Mr. Mobison has been an adjunct professor of finance at Columbia Business School since 1993 and currently is the chairman of Board of Trustees for the Santa Fe Institute. Making change transpire. That's the mission behind the most amazing tasting protein bar brand taking the nutrition industry by storm. That brand, they're MCT Co. and they make the most delicious, keto-friendly, all-natural collagen protein bars. If you're obsessed with the quality of food going into your body like I am, then head out and pick up these amazing bars jammed with 10 grams of collagen protein. They only have two to three net carbs, no added sugar, and loaded with high quality MCT oil for the healthy fats from coconuts. Whether you're busy running the kids around from activity to activity, a professional athlete, or just someone looking for a great tasting convenience snack, do yourself a favor, head to mctco.com and use code WGYT for 20% off your order. Michael, welcome to What Got You There. How are you doing today? Thanks, Sean. Great to be with you. Yes, I am very much looking forward to this conversation. And I thought a fun place to begin would be with lacrosse. We're both former lacrosse players. You played attack at Georgetown in the 80s. And I'd love hearing, do you have a favorite lacrosse memory? Well, um, Sean, I'd have to say probably my favorite memory is uh, (laughs) post-college. So I, I, uh, <laughs> so I would, you know, I played at Georgetown, uh, the, the programs improved a lot, but it was a time when it was really transitioning. So it was, it was uh, it, the quality of the play was not what it is today. Um, but I, I played a fair bit after school and uh, in master's program. And, and, and probably about a dozen years ago, I was with a team uh, at playing out the Vail tournament. And we had like, we had just not that many guys. We had 13 or 14 guys. So everybody was playing a lot of positions. Actually, I was playing midfield for that. And we were sort of a scrappy underdog team, and, and we ended up pretty early on winning a game in overtime that was sort of unexpected. And then we went on and be- beat like the, the Navy ex, you know, eight Navy team in the semis, and then we ended up beating the ex Hobart guys in the final. So we won the the Vale Championship. So actually, as a, as a lacrosse moment, that was actually the most the most exciting thing that I went through. And, and, and again, we were sort of like underdogs in each of these games, and everyone thought we were going to lose. The, the great thing was the Hobart guys had brought uh, cigars and champagne for themselves, assuming that they had it locked up. And so they, they very they, they very generously and, and kindly, warm heartedly, like shared the, the cigars and champagne with us after we won. But that that was great. And, you know, part of it is, as you know, as, as an athlete, that um, that was a team that was small and obviously we're coming together to play a tournament. But one of the things I remarked about that team was it was obviously closely knit and we had great players at each position, but there was an enormous amount of trust on that team. So Every guy, obviously, every guy had to contribute his or her his his capabilities, but there was just an enormous amount of trust, which was really a really fun part to fun to be part of that, and also for that to come together in uh, in a good outcome. Anything besides trust that have really stuck with you and translated from the sports field onto the, onto the business realm and investing world? Yeah, Sean, I, I think it's, I'm sure you have the same sensation. Um, there's there's very little in life that gets done without hard work, and you know I think in athletics that's certainly the case. 
as well. So it's who, who are the guys that really are working hard? Who are the guys are uh, are grinding it out, going the extra mile to get things done? So that that to me is no, there's no substitute for hard work. And I, I certainly see it in athletics. Um, I never obviously never played in an elite level, but you, you can be sure that anyone's playing at an elite level. They all have tremendous uh, underlying talent. And really that hard work, I think, is a huge component. So that that to me is another thing that translates directly over. But trust, yeah, um, that's a that's just a big component is having trust in your in your partners and your teammates. And uh, not all not all athletes do it, and not all certainly business people do it. But I think that's an incredibly powerful thing when you have that uh, in terms of a collective success. No, I absolutely agree. I mean, you've been a, a leader both on the sports field, being being a co captain at Georgetown, and then also everything you've done outside of that. Are there differences between leadership at elite sports level and in business or to the investing world? Yeah, I don't know. I wouldn't say that I was a leader at an elite level. Um, I will mention, Sean, there's a there's a book called The Captain Class. Do you know this book? Yeah. So we've actually had the author on. Uh, that was a few All right. Years okay. Ago. So I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry to that. Yeah. So right. That. So I thought that that's the most definitive discussion I think about leadership and probably a number of those things cross over. And you you know more about this than I do probably. But right. It's often the case that the leader on a sports team is not always the best player, whatever that means. But a guy, you know, he, he had this phrase he called a water carrier, right? Someone who's just like ready to, to do basically anything it takes to succeed. Um, great communication skills, really important. They don't have to be verbal. They can be other cues. I thought the great, the, that discussion about Tim Duncan was really fascinating. Um, so, yeah, I think a lot of those things do do map uh, map over pretty, pretty carefully. And, and, you know, part of it is, too, just being being yourself, being authentic, right? So you don't whenever you emerge as a leader in any, uh, or even I observe leaders, you want them to be authentic um, and to be, to, to do it in a way that's consistent with how their, you know, their own personality and so forth. So it's a little bit different for everybody. And I think a lot of, I think a lot of um, even coaches and teachers sometimes can go early on astray by trying to be someone else. And uh, the best is to try, the, the best thing to do is to be the best version of yourself, right? So one of the things that comes up over and over again, especially with, with current athletes and, and trying to figure out that transition uh, into the business world, and for you, it ended up being finance. How did that happen for you? Well, listen, I knew I had no future in athletics. So um, by the way, I'll, I'll just go back. It's funny. I, you know, I played three sports in high school, and I probably could have played all, all those sports in college on some level. But I remember I played ice hockey, and I, was, I was, had this I was, I was a junior or senior in high school, and I'm playing against this guy. Um, Clark Donatelli, by the way, who, who's actually gone on. I think he, he made it to the NHL. He didn't have a big career, but I think he's coaching. But I'm, I'm playing against this guy, and I'm thinking to myself, I am working as hard as I possibly can just to not make a fool of myself, right? Like, I'm, like, I'm not thinking about anything productive. I'm just, like, trying not to – I'm just trying to keep this guy in check to some degree. And I'm thinking, okay, well, I have no future in this, right? So I better I better hit the books. Um so, yeah, no, I, I knew pretty much that there was going to be no future for me in athletics. And, you know, it, it, it is interesting because I know that you've got uh, experiences coaching and and I've I've done some t I teach. And I think that there's a lot of parallels between coaching and teaching. Maybe we could talk about that. But, yeah, so I knew I was going to have to go into the business world. And so um, and I and I have to say candidly that in my youth, really, even through college, I, I spent a lot of time and energy on athletics and that was probably to some degree to the detriment of my academic development. You know, I was never a bad student, but not probably what I could have been. And I think that uh, so so once it I turned to the business world, I had to get a little bit more serious, both uh, well, just in terms of getting a job, but also developing or catching up a little bit um, intellectually and academically. So, yeah, I mean, my my uh, uh, I, I was it's very fortuitous to get my first job was at Drexel Burnham. Lambert back in the mid 1980s. And back then there were a lot of really wonderful training programs that these banks held. And so I was able to get into a training program, which in a sense gave, you know, lay, sort of laid out the framework for what I needed to understand. And, and the other thing about that training program that was really unique, and I think very valuable for me and probably the other people in the program is that we rotated through, we did classroom instruction first, but then we rotated through different departments of the investment bank. So you spent time on a trading desk and time in investment banking, time in you know research, time in operations. So it, as, as someone who's trying to <clears throat> match your skills to understand like what you're good at, what you think, where you think you can contribute, what is aligned with sort of how you operate, um, it's, a, it's a tremendous opportunity to do sampling and figure that out. So that for me was also very useful. Um, some people go on trading desks and get very <clears throat> fired up, and that's what they love to do. That was not my thing. Other people get go into research settings and work on projects. That gets much more excited. 
So it was a really a, a, a very valuable opportunity to to have uh, an opportunity to match to match personality and skills with uh, with a job uh, yeah. description. No, I just want to highlight what you mentioned, just in terms of being true to yourself and understanding what skills you have and, and how to exploit them. How did you end up getting your foot in the door of that training program? Well, <clears throat> you may have read about you may have read this story, but uh, you know, I was um, I my father. I grew up in Ithaca, New York, Central New York, and my father was. Uh, a car dealer. And so actually for a couple summers, I spent, uh, on the floor selling cars and, and I was not very good at that, by the way, but I did learn a lot about sales. And I thought those skills, by the way, are very valuable for anybody to learn basic skills techniques. And so, um, you know, I'm looking for a job and I've I know I need to get a job. And so when I, <clears throat> one of the firms that recruited was Drexel, they came onto campus and they were looking for a program that this, this program ultimately led you to be a financial advisor. So essentially a broker. So selling would be part of that job. So I think that I had enough to say about that, that it let me get to the New York, uh, to New York interviews. <clears throat> so when I went to New York and, you know, there, there are quite a few kids that were uh, interviewing for this, for these jobs. And I, you know, I just, this is always a, a fun story to tell. I mean, you know, they, they sort of got all the the students in a conference room in the morning and you're looking at each other very nervously wearing your fanciest suit. Right. And, and they said, well, you're going to meet with all different people in the training program, but then you're going to have 10 minutes with the head guy. And so, uh, you know, you, you do your very best. And I, so I go, I get, I meet the big guy, right. You know, he's got this beautiful office and, you know, really expansive and <clears throat> the guy was super nice. But as I walked into his office, he had a Washington Redskins trash can sitting by his desk. And, you know, I was going to school in DC. I, you know, I mean, I wasn't a particularly big Redskins fan, but you know, they were doing really well at the time. I'd gone to a couple of games. So I was, I was sort of on the bandwagon. So I said to him, like, hey, uh, Mr. Sure, this is a great uh, trash can. And, you know, as I like to say, it hit him like emotionally. So he, you know, my, my 10 minute interview ended up being 15 minutes of me basically nodding my head and him going on about the virtues of athletics and how he loved living in Washington and, and so on and so forth. And so, um, you know, that was fine. So I really said nothing or very little. And he was just going on. And so uh, I go off and I get the job offer, which is great. So I start and a few months into the program, one of the guys who runs a program sort of pulls me aside. He says, hey, I just want to tell you, you know, you're doing great. So we're really pleased with your, your performance. But I have to just I'll let you know now that the other people you interviewed with voted against hiring you. <laughs> and the head guy came in and said, hey, this kid is really great. We should bring him into the program. So as I like to say, my career was launched by a trash can. It was really this sort of fortuitous thing. Um, and, uh, you know, I look, I think that in retrospect, I, I hope that he feels like he made the right decision. But but that's an interesting example of of connecting with somebody on a level that really wasn't about just pure business. But he he obviously, you know, you know, he, right. It sparked an emotional reaction in him that ultimately led me uh, down this path, which is, again, you know, a lot of like it, life is uh, sort of these lucky, lucky turns. And that was one of them for me. Yeah, we're going to talk a lot about luck. Uh, it's something I've learned a great deal from you from. <laughs> But, but one of the things I want to hit on first is you are one of the clearest business thinkers I've ever come across, if not the clearest. And this makes me wonder just about your ability to think about business and your thinking process in general. Do you have an actual process that you allocate towards thinking? Um, not really, but I, I do think um, – I think you're making a couple of points that are really important. And I've had in my career – I've been very fortunate to be able to do um, two things – that I help, I think help in that regard a lot, or maybe three things, right? One is I've been able to allocate a lot of time to it. So whereas a lot of people are really doing things, I mean, I had to do things when I was an analyst and, an, and a strategist, but I, I, I've had for a long time quite a bit of time to allocate to study as a professional. And that's a tremendous, um, tremendous benefit. The second thing is um, writing. And so I've uh, had the opportunity to, to write a lot as part of my job and even working on writing some books. Um, and I'll mention one of my books. I, you know, I, I had an editor work with me, a guy named Lawrence Gonzalez, who, who was amazing. And when I sent Lawrence, I first just sent it to him very casually. And he said, well, I'd like to line edit this for you. <clears throat> and so I was like, all right, great. So he sent it back. And not only did he line edit my book, he actually wrote basically in the margins, here's, here's this mistake you keep making. Here's why you're always muddled in these particular situations. Here's you're using this expression the wrong way. He was actually teaching me about writing as we were going through this. And I just recall going through his edits was one of the most difficult weeks I've ever had uh, professionally, but incredibly uh, valuable in terms of understanding how to communicate more clearly 
and you know cut out a lot of fluff and so forth. And then the last thing I'll say is teaching. And as you know, just teaching and coaching, same thing. It's it's one thing to think you know what something means or how to do something. It's a very different different thing to communicate it to get that into the mind of another. And uh, I think teaching instills incredible discipline. You really can't teach something until you understand it, and so you can't fake it, right? And, and if you if you do fake it, especially with graduate students, it's going to be clear pretty quickly. And I always like to say great teachers are great students. And I think great coaches, by the way, are great students. So it's a sort of circular process and never ends. So those things really, having time to allocate, writing and the discipline of writing, and then teaching all sort of work together, I think, to, uh, to move toward that objective is, is to, like you said, to get clearer and more correct about uh, ideas whenever possible. This is fantastic, Michael. I think this is really going to set a good framework uh, for the next few minutes here. You, you identified these three things. Did you have early models that you also saw these men in, in places you wanted to be emulating these three characteristic and traits? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, I grew up in, as I mentioned, I grew up in central New York. We uh, grew up in a family without really any books. And it was, so my, my parents were both bright. They never went to college, but they were very, they were bright and they were very focused on education, but they weren't modeling this kind of stuff very much at all. Um, but I will say that obviously my, you know, I had a, an epiphany moment in, uh, in my training program when one of my training colleagues gave me a copy of Al Rappaport's book called Creating Shoulder Value. That was probably 1987 or 1988. Rappaport had written that book in 1986. And as I like to say, I mean, I, I, was, an, I was a humanities major, right? I was a government major going on to Wall Street and I knew none of the stuff. I knew none of the jargon. I knew none of the, you know, so like all the, 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 the way people communicated and the way they did everything. And so it was all brand new to me. And by the way, very confusing to me. And I read Rappaport's book. And for me, it was like a lightning bolt of clarity. And so I would say that that, that reading that book started to give me a framework to, to think about the world more effectively. Um, Al, by the way, has grown into uh, become a very dear friend. Uh, we collaborate on a lot of stuff. <clears throat> we wrote a book together uh, 20 years ago. And I just say that almost and to this day, my conversations with him are incredibly valuable to help flesh out ideas. And, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I, I would never admit this publicly, but, you know, sometimes as a teacher, I'm a little bit stuck about how to think about something or how to communicate something. And I just make my call to him and say, here's what I'm, you know, here's, here's sort of where I'm stuck here. I don't know how to say this. And just spending a few minutes with, the, with him on the phone uh, allows me to, to be able to sort of work through that. So, yeah, those, that he would be great. And then I just say the other thing that really helps, I think, with writing and thinking to a large degree is reading. So if anybody said, how do I become a better writer? How do I become a better thinker? I think the answer is really that you have to allocate time to reading. When you read a lot, you start to realize the kinds of language that resonate with you, who writes clearly, who gets ideas into your mind, um, who, wh what is memorable to you. And so I think you start to understand, you, you know, again, you bake it into what your your own writing style is. But it's like it's like listening to other musicians. Right. You probably integrate. You hope to integrate the things that are really helpful to embellish on your own uh, on your own style. So I think reading has been another huge component in all this, not only just to learn, but also to understand what you like and how to communicate more effectively. I'd love to jump into your writing process. But do you have any examples of people you look to in terms of clear writing? Well, I mean, look, I think that there, there are two people I, I mentioned right off the top of my head. Michael Lewis is like a freak. Um, <laughs> he is so good and so talented and, um, you know, it almost makes me like, uh, it's like, I don't know. I don't know how to, the, the guy's so good. Um, so he's one example. Um, Matt Levine writes a column for Bloomberg, which is, you know, it's like the highlight of my day when that thing hits my inbox. He's so, he's funny. He's lucid. He's clear. He's provocative. He's got a great nose for stories. So that's another, he, he'd be another guy I would point to. Um, but there are a lot of, you know, there are a lot of, obviously a lot of great writers. I, I do like science writers too, that can write clearly and, and informatively, you know, Steven Pinker or um, Richard Dawkins are examples of guys that, that, that their, their prose really connects with how I think about things. So those would be some examples that I would cite. Yeah. Steven Pinker, I know has put something out online. I think it's his 13 examples of clear writing we can add that one into the show notes you mentioned reading and that's where you pull a lot of ideas from i take it your idea generation process just far outweighs the capabilities of your output so i'd love to know how do you balance the exploration <laughs> versus exploitation problem 
I love that. I love that. You know, so uh, I, I I always worry that I'm going to run out of things to, to write about. So I kind of keep a, like a little running list of things. And I'm like, I, you know, so you cross off the top one as you write about it and then you add something to the bottom. And it does seem like the, an endless, uh, an endless journey. That's one of the virtues of being involved with business and in being involved with markets is that there, there you never lick the game, right? You always have something to learn. There's always new something new, some development, so on and so forth. Um, I but be nice to say I, I wish I could be uh, had a more systematic answer to this. I, I basically just sort of follow my nose and what seems to be interesting to me at a particular time, or you know just because my curiosity in, in a particular topic, I just don't. Either I don't understand something or I don't I have not read anything that allows me to understand something. Those tend to be the areas where where I gravitate. A lot of the work we do is, I would say, I would really call it synthesis. We do some original stuff, but a lot of it is synthesis, which is, say, really trying to 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 garner the best ideas or thoughts in a, on a particular topic and bring them together in a way that that allows gives hopefully allows us and some other people some insight as to how it works. So yeah, I, I just sort of uh, follow my nose around is the best answer to that question. <laughs> yeah, sometimes synthesis is just an indication of better understanding. So yeah, the, the deeper you can go on that, it always seems to be incredibly beneficial. You mentioned a second ago about you, you love when you don't understand something. What does it look like in the first couple days when you come across something new you, you're unfamiliar with? What does that look like for you? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. That really does speak to my just my writing process in general. So what I tend to do is phase one is to just read as much as I can about the particular topic. And for us, if it's an investing related topic, it usually means identifying um, often academic papers, but also things from the business press, but usually academic papers and literally trying to identify and you know cast as wide a net as possible as to what papers would be relevant. And then I basically just try to read them all. And uh, as I'm reading them, I'm trying to take notes. Uh, so I have uh, some mental references, you know, so that's writing on the margins and so on and so forth. And I almost always have a legal pad near me. So I'll jot down notes. And so that I'll just sort of bomb through that. And that takes time, right? And by the way, that there could be a lot of other things going on. So I'll just allocate time to that over time, uh, over some period. And then, uh, then the fa second phase is really trying to sit down with that legal pad and just organize some sort of an outline for that. So I I know some people write without outlines. I don't know how those people do it, but I write everything. I try to outline everything before I write it, just to, so I know that I know where I'm going. I know where where I can refer back to material and so on and so forth. I think it just helps me. And and by the way, I struggle. I mean, sometimes these things look like they they come out okay, but often it's it's a real struggle to come up with an outline that that seems to flow at least the way the way I would think about the topic. And and I, I Sean, I, I suspect this is true for you as well. But um, a lot of the time where I'm, I'm sort of working through those kinds of concepts is, is usually like when I'm, you know, working out or something like that, right? Like I'm doing something different. I'm walking the dogs or I'm working out or, or it's, you know, before I go to sleep or right when I wake up, you know, sort of these quiet or in the shower, right? Literally these quiet moments where the, I, I pose the problem to my mind and let the mind work through it and eventually sort of like, like turn it out. And then, so then once I have the material, I've read it, I've outlined it. And by the way, as I go through the outlines, I'll refer back, you know, paper X, this page, go back to that. And then I, then I try to put pen to paper. And the other thing that, you know, we, we are relentless about is editing. So not the, the first drafts, I try to make them pretty decent, but we spend enormous amounts of time going back and editing and improving and refining and that process. I think that most of us don't want to do that, right? You just want to hand your paper to the teacher and get an A, but, uh, but you realize in the real world that editing and that iteration process is really, um, really vital. Yeah, I'm smiling over here just because in preparation for this interview, which is one I, I mentioned to you, I've been looking forward to for years. Uh, so this morning I happened to take an extra long shower just so I could really visualize this conversation. Uh, and then even yesterday afternoon, a long walk, because that is it's when I do my clearest thinking. It seems like very similar to you. I, I'd love to dive on some of you, your papers, and we'll call them your white papers. And you would know better than me when you first started doing it. Was it around 2003 you first started publishing these? Uh, probably there's some in the 90s. Okay. <clears throat> for sure. Some in the 90s, late 90s. But yeah, yeah. So um, so multiple decades. I'm wondering, over those multiple decades, has there been much of a change in, in terms of how you go about writing these? Do you just feel like you have a more intuitive sense uh, of how to uncover these problems and then clearly synthesize them? I think so. I mean, I think like anything in life, it's an accumulated, there's just more accumulated knowledge, right? So uh, I just know more stuff and have seen more stuff and so could integrate more stuff. 
Um, and, you know, it's interesting, for example, uh, Al Rappaport and I are discussing the prospects of doing a revised version of Expectations Investing. That book came out in 2001, so this would be roughly 20 years later. And, you know, we were just commenting and reflecting on how much we've learned in 20 years. Um, so a lot of the bones of what we wrote about are still really good and, and really relevant, but there's been so much stuff that's happened and so much that we've learned in the, in the past two decades. So I think that that cumulative learning process uh, just adds a lot of spice, even if the core ideas are the same. And I find that even for my course, you know, I've been teaching my course since the early 1990s. And, you know, it's a very good question to ask how much is different versus, you know, 25 or <clears throat> 30 years ago. And the answer is a lot of it is actually the same because some of the concepts are sort of immutable concepts. But there's just so much around the edges about what 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 I've learned and what I think the collective world has learned that uh, can get integrated into it in an effective way. So, yeah, I, I think I, I hope that I get better at this as time goes on, because um, a there's I just get more practice doing things and B uh, there is just more, I think, general knowledge out there that we can that we can integrate into what we're doing. Yeah, you, you mentioned those immutable concepts, and I was spending a, a larger chunk of time a few months ago just diving deep on some of your early work, and believe me, they, they still hold true today and, and certainly resonate. You were speaking about that accumulated knowledge. I'm wondering, though, is, is there a skill or mindset of yours that you just find the most difficult to transfer to, to even the most talented people on your team? Uh, can you say that one more time? What, what Say it one more time. So besides accumulated knowledge, I'm just wondering, yeah. is, is there a certain skill or mindset of yours that's just oh, yeah. very hard oh, yeah, to transfer? Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, look, I, I'm, I'm, I'm one of those guys. There's, there's nothing special about me and what I do. I, I think that everybody's got to be true to themselves to some degree. You know, so, so for example, I tend to spend a fair bit of time reading and, and people are sometimes impressed by how much I read, but I'm, it's trade-offs, right? Because I'm not doing something else if I'm reading, right? And so, uh, and what I, the kind of work that I do is not everybody's cup of tea, nor should it be everybody's cup of tea. And there are a lot of other people that do things that I can't do very effectively at all, right? And, you know, trading is an example. I think I would be horrible at that. And, and um, I mean, I know actually my first job as a financial advisor, I did that for about a year and was an abject failure at it. So I, I, I've experienced, you know, failure and understand. So yeah, I, 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 no, not really. I, I do think that it's, it's great to be part of a team or an organization where there is a lot of intellectual curiosity, where there is uh, open-mindedness. And so those qualities, I think that A, you can sort of pre-sort for them to some degree, but you can also cultivate those as an organization. So I don't find any, um, you know, and, and the other thing is interesting just in the investment business too, is that, or it's, it's actually everywhere sports, is that um, sometimes success can lead people to think that what they're doing is the only, th you know, the only thing they need to know, right? And so there's their success sometimes breeds a little bit of, um, I don't know whether it's inertia or, you know, complacency. And, uh, you know, as you know, the greatest, the greatest athletes, the greatest coaches, the greatest organizations are ones that are constantly striving to improve and to learn. And uh, so I think that's also another, but, but I, I'm not trying to confer anything that I do to anybody else. I'm, I'm trying to learn from other people more than, more than, uh, and try to impart anything on them. Yeah, no, I, I love the humility. And <laughs> you're just even talking just about just those people who are constantly learning and improving. And you obviously know one of the most important pieces of that is feedback. And you were talking about the editing process with your writing. What other ways are you just incorporating feedback loops into your life? Yeah, I think it's, it's really important, uh, especially, you know, I think the quality of the feedback is, is very different in different types of activities. <clears throat> and, you know, so when, when your activity is largely skill-based and, you know, you think about playing the piano or, um, you know, well, music is just a great example or a, t or a tennis player or something. So, so a teacher can really observe you and give you very pointed feedback that can be helpful. Um, but when you get more on the luck side of things, when there's more randomness, and I think markets are a really good example, investing is, is generally a very good example. <clears throat> it's very difficult to get, to get high quality feedback. So I think the answer is to focus as much on process as possible. Now, you know, the feedback um, <clears throat> for what we do is I uh, the, the, the clearest example where I get feedback is actually in the classroom, because as I present ideas, I can see people, whether they understand what I'm talking about or not. So I get I get a vi I get visual cues, obviously get questions, but also visual cues. And so the key is to tune um, to tune the, the presentations and the message to uh, to make sure that you're getting maximum impact. Um, over the years, also I've done a you know I do a fair bit of presenting, whether they're you know client meetings or whatever. 
And I'll tell you something else that's funny for me is that, you know, for example, I would show, I, I would have a concept or even have a joke in my presentation or something I thought was lighthearted. <clears throat> and people look at me like I'm an idiot. So I was like, I can now understand what these comedians are like. Like they go to these clubs and they're, they're trying out their material. And, and, you know, something you think is really clever may not go over well. And something you may think is not very clever tends to go over well. And you just have to sort of go with what works, right? So there's some of that as well. So I try to be attuned to that. Um, by the same token, um, over the years, I, I've from time to time have gotten people saying to me like, uh, you know, you should, you should do this, that, or the other. And, and if it didn't feel right to me, um, if I felt that what I was doing was more, was more, was better or more authentic, I would, I would actually not pay attention to some feedback. So part of it is, is gathering proper feedback, especially from sources that you respect. And I think like an audience of a, of a student body, for example, is great, but also to make sure that um, they're, they're as, and I think that's great for any successful organization is going to have people along the way saying like, what you're doing is not right, or why would you be doing this way or whatever. And you have to have a little bit of fortitude of the vision and the, the backbone of what you're doing to, uh, to also understand when you shouldn't pay attention to feedback. Yeah, you've been teaching since 93 Columbia School of Business. And earlier, you were just kind of <clears throat> mentioning some of the parallels, even even to coaching that there is in teaching. What else in teaching do you think is very important for the teacher to help his students or their students? Yeah, I think that, and, and I, Sean, I don't know if you're, what your experience is like, but if you reflect back on um, like the great teachers or coaches you've had in your life, and, and by the way, they tend to be quite memorable, but I think that one of the qualities I was, what I always find is, so, so as I mentioned, they're great. I mean, they're usually a few things. One is they're good communicators, right? So they have, they have the capability of taking what can be complex ideas and making them understandable so that you walk out and you say, man, that's cool. I now understand something I didn't understand before. I think great teachers are great learners, right? So they, it's not like they have a set of bo a body of information they're trying to con convey and just do it in a classroom and then that's it. They're constantly learning themselves. And that you know, speaks to the, the intellectual curiosity um, as well. So those would be uh, those would be some of the some uh, to me some of the very big qualities of of great teachers. Um, yeah, those would be two big ones. Yeah, I, I've never had the the honor of sitting in one of your classes, but I, I've seen a number of your presentations and, and different videos you've been a part of, <laughs> and your communication skills are are second to none. You're you're so clear, so concise. Your work is so buttoned up. I would love to know how much work goes into let's call it an hour long talk for you. Yeah, that's a good question, and. Um, you know, the other thing is that I'm a, I'm a fairly strong introvert. So these kinds of things are not, uh, you know, I, I can now do presentations, but it's not necessarily a comfort zone for me. I'll mention in the mid 1990s, I went to a school, a place called the Buckley School of Public Speaking. So it's down in uh, Camden, South Carolina. And it's a couple day, two and a half day um, training session on public speaking. And they, they teach you a lot of techniques uh, to improve the quality of your speaking. Um, I, I'm not sure I do all the things I'm supposed to do all the time, but, but it was very helpful for me. But I think you've, you've hit on the key point. And, and again, this, this also relates to business and athletics and so forth, which is the importance of preparation. And I think that many people feel that uh, they can, maybe, maybe wing it's a little bit of a strong term, but they underprepare. And uh, my tendency is, is probably to over-prepare. So I, I prepare a lot for those things. So, I, you know, when you say one-hour presentation, and often I'm doing those things the first time, you, you know, you're, you're probably, what you've probably seen is after a bunch of practice and having done it and refined it and so forth. But, um, no, I spend, I spend a lot of time on it. And I'll give me one sort of more concrete thing. When I was an analyst back in the day, we would go on the morning meeting and you talk about a particular idea, you know, I'm upgrading the stock or downgrading the stock or whatever it is. And you would get three minutes to do that, three minutes. So you have to be able to communicate your idea as, as, as effectively and compellingly as possible in three minutes. Hmm. And um, I would spend, you know, I, I usually would say like an hour or 60 to 90 minutes crafting that three minute presentation to really make sure I was picking the right words, that I was uh, introducing the right statistical, the numbers, right, to animate the ideas and so forth. And I think that that ends up paying off, right? And you, and again, that's a case where you're getting feedback. So if you do it well, you realize what worked. If you do it poorly, you realize what didn't work. And the other thing I'll say for that is I also like to listen also, you know, it's like reading. I like to listen to other people and see what works, you know, again, Maybe it's, it's idiosyncratic, like what works for me, but who is a good speaker? Who is clear? Who is compelling? 
And um, yeah, so just observing other people and trying to, again, take their greatest hits and say, look, that's a quality I, I want to, I want to emulate. Yeah. Well, well, envy is a strong word and believe me, I, I envy the amount of work that is so apparent that you must put in, in order to execute those hour long conversations. <clears throat> I, I was pretty blown away a second ago. You mentioned the Buckley school of public speaking, which was just some two day course years and years ago. Are there any other things like that, that, that you've done in your life that just had such a tremendous long lasting impact for you? Uh, not, not that I can think of, but I will say that the, the Buckley experience has been, you know, it's, it wasn't just like a one-off. It was something that ended up really, it, it, first of all, it was very useful from the very beginning, but integrating that stuff has been, been helpful. And so actually I do my, I, you know, in my course, I have my students do presentations as the end of the course. And so they're working in groups, <clears throat> but, um, I give them, uh, a module in how to do a presentation. And so I, I teach them some of the techniques. Some of them are things I learned from Buckley, some of the things I learned from other sources, um, but I teach them how to do it. And a number of students come back to me and say, like, and we, and I love the course, but actually that no one had ever told us exactly how to do a presentation and having those guidelines in place were very helpful. So yeah, I, I, think, a lot about, I think a lot about that. But I, again, you know, like when you talk about like those, I, I would say that reading, reading Rappaport's book was an epiphany moment. I would say that, reading Mitch Waldrop's book about the Santa Fe Institute called complexity and going out to Santa Fe Institute, that was sort of this, you know, epiphany moment for me. So there, there have been certainly moments that have been, uh, in, in many ways, professionally life-changing that, uh, that are worth noting, but that, you know, the Buckley thing is a skill development thing. And I would say Lawrence Gonzalez too, having him edit that one book. And then he edited my, my latter book, having him work through that and teach me so graciously teach me as he was correcting me was, was super powerful. And by the way, even when I try to edit, you know, if I edit my, my kids papers, for example, for, for college or whatever, I never change any of the ideas, but what I'm hopeful that they're getting when I'm editing from, for me is that understanding what I'm doing and why I'm doing it so that they can learn how to do it properly the next time. Right. So it's not just about, uh, correcting it. It's really about trying to teach how to do it properly so that they need me less and less as they go on. Michael, I'm not, I'm not even sure if, you, if you're aware of just how much wisdom uh, you're putting out right now. So I'm so appreciative of this. You mentioned just giving the, the presentation uh, for your students and, and helping them through that. Most of them have, have never experienced that. Is there anything else that they just take away that seems incredibly valuable that you do as a teacher? Well, that you should, be, you should if there's anything there, you would, I would have to ask the students, but <laughs> I guess I guess the other component on on teaching, which I probably neglected to mention, was just passion. And as you know, people who are passionate about their topic, um, I think it tends to come through and animate the whole the whole concept. And one of the things I'll say that I do uh, I, I do in my teaching, um, which I didn't see all the teachers do for me or for my classes, was to learn the history of ideas. And I've always found that to be fascinating. By the way, again, you look at great coaches for instance, um, almost all of them understand the history of their sport and the history of the ideas and how they've come along. And, un, you know, and they spend time to understand the evolution of their, their game. And I've always found that to be fascinating. So in the world of business and investing and finance, there's, there are obviously very long, deep and rich traditions. And, you know, there are um, paths that the intellectual paths that these different disciplines take and just understanding that and understanding where these ideas come from and how they how they arose in the first place i find that stuff to be fascinating and i think it's a very valuable component of pedagogy so a very valuable component of teaching is to say here's this idea that we have here's where it came from here's why it's valuable here's how to think about it right and i'll, I'll i will say the, that my course that um there, there, we, we, we don't have official mottos, but we have two mottos that I, I share with them the very first day. One is, um, it, it's a Latin phrase that's the uh, motto of the Royal Society. And it's, it's called null, it's nullius in verba. But the, the translation for, of nullius in verba is really, um, do, don't take anybody's word for it. Think for yourself. So I, I say to the students, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guide this. I'm going to sort of lead this discussion over the next semester and I'm gonna I'm gonna impart some frameworks and tools. I, I'm hopeful that you're that you'll find useful uh, as you go through life. But it's nullius in verba, right? Don't take my word for it. Um, 
think for yourself always. And if something doesn't make sense to you, you should always um, ask or challenge, right? And the second is, there was a quote from the mathematician Carl Gauss, and he said, um, it's also in Latin, but basically said, uh, not notations, but notions, right? So in other words, don't worry about math before you understand concepts. So concepts first, and then bringing on the tools and all that to sort of specify that. But concepts first, and by the way, I think that's also very important, even in you know, analytics and sports and so forth, and certainly in, in the world of finance and business, is to understand concepts first and then having those notations, the numbers animate that rather than the other way around. So people sometimes go right to these equations or numbers and don't really have the full context. So those, are, those would be some other things I would just throw out there that I think that's behind the scenes. I'm not sure the students are so aware that I'm thinking about this stuff, but I think that's the stuff that I, I think might be might be helpful in the in the bigger equation. No, the behind the scenes stuff I, I find is a lot of times where the gems lay. So I'm going to ask you to wrap up all of human history here in terms of double clicking on the history of ideas. And if, if you're going to dive a little bit deeper on that, just in terms of finance and business, what are some of those broad things you've uncovered there? Well, I mean, for I, I'll just I'll recommend a couple uh, a couple books in terms of finance. The the two books I think are just outstanding in this regard are Peter Bernstein wrote a book called Against the Gods: The Remarkable Story of Risk. It's awesome. And it's, yeah, and so you know the book, and it's a history of our understanding of risk. Um, that there there are chapters that are yet to be written, so that's fascinating. And I always say to my students, it's it's an exciting time to be young because there are so many things we don't understand, and, and in your careers, you're going to be able to explore those things and define them, and and that's that's cool. And the second book he wrote was called Capital Ideas, which is really, and he's got, there are two versions of it, but it's sort of the history of the development of ideas in capital markets and capital theory. So that's, those to me would be, <clears throat> so they're not certainly the ideas of mankind, but but in terms of finance, I think those are two really valuable books. But I do spend a lot, you know, even like John Burr Williams wrote a book in the 1930s called Theory of Investment Value. So this was a really, you know, early um, treatment of how to think about valuation and understanding Williams's place and sort of how we think about valuation today is really, uh, those are the kinds of things I find to be really cool, right? Because it's, it puts things into the proper intellectual context. You always know pe people love hearing book recommendations. So this is going to be an absolute treasure trove here. So I appreciate that. When you started at Columbia in 93, I have to assume you guys didn't even have behavior finance courses. And if we're going to fast forward 30 years in the future and look back where do you think people are going to be dumbfounded that we didn't concentrate more right now on? That's a great question. By the way, we there there were no behavioral finance courses. <clears throat> um, what I what I suggested to my students even back then was that they take negotiations courses because negotiations was the closest thing that they could get to understand. And what's powerful about negotiation, as you know, is um, and I, and I'm not a negotiations teacher, but I, I think that this idea it's a really valuable idea in life, which is understanding the other person's point of view, right? So you have to understand what, what what is acceptable to you and you have to understand where the other person's coming from. And then obviously what you're trying to do is find a, 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 a solution that's at, it's mutually advantageous. So this idea of just literally understanding other people, and I think a lot of what comes down in behavioral finance is actually understanding the behaviors and, and thought processes of, of other people. Um, I do think that um, look, there are, there are a bunch a bunch of areas that we just don't understand. I, I tell my students very first day, I'm like, I'm going to, there are more questions than there are answers in finance, right? So there are a lot of things we don't really understand very well. Some core ideas that we, I think, don't fully understand are market, things like market efficiency and market inefficiency. So what, what makes a asset prices correct in quotation marks and what makes them, I know. So we have ideas and, and I certainly have written a little bit about this, but, but I think, I don't think that's buttoned down. Um, what is the concept of risk? Do we really understand what risk is? Um, are there better ways to think about that? Might we be able to do that? <clears throat> Going back to this idea of market efficiency, one of the, one of the areas that I've always found fascinating is, is sort of this idea of the wisdom of crowds. And the key to the wisdom of crowds working is you have to have diversity of the underlying agents, in this case, investors. You have to have an aggregation mechanism, so a way to bring that information together, and you need proper incentives. Well, we don't really know how to measure diversity all that well. And that's another area I think going, you know, if you said 30 years from now, looking back, I would really hope that we do a better job of, of really thinking about diversity. And, and, and we talk about diversity in organizations, we almost always talk about social category diversity. So age, gender, ethnicity, and so forth. But really what we're after is cognitive diversity. So the ways we think and our mental models and our training and our experience and 
yeah, I, I think we're 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 making some strides, but how we understand that stuff is still, I think, still quite nascent. So that's another area. And then the, the last area, there's been a ton of ink spilled on this, obviously, but even things like competitive strategy. So you know, what makes for a good business? What makes for a a sustainably good business? Um, that's a big area. And maybe I'll mention one more, which is <clears throat> we spent a lot of time and written a lot about this concept called base rates, which is essentially a repository of, of history, of corporate performance in particular, for instance. So, so you know, how, how have companies grown? What have been, what's happened to their profits? What, and all these kinds of things. And, and the, the premise is that some understanding of history can be helpful in understanding potential outcomes for the future. So that whole area, in, in terms of building out databases, if you will, of, of past performance, I think that's still vastly underutilized and vastly underdeveloped. And that might be something in 20 or 30 years that we we're much more robust at doing. Yeah, it's certainly an exciting time, the ability to then dive deeper and explore more of these. One of the things I love exploring, one of my passions, is just around understanding behavior and psychology so that I can make better decisions and, and hopefully those decisions lead to better outcomes. When did you start looking at heuristics and biases and just their overall impact on investors? Yeah, it's a great question, Sean. I, you know, I think that um, the... As I started teaching my course, the thing that I really ended up, the biggest change over the years has been precisely what you described, you know, sort of the behavioral stuff. And, you know, I sort of probably became aware of that in the mid 90s, late 1990s, and started to read about it fairly actively at that time. As I mentioned, I'd sat in on some negotiation classes and learned a little bit of those techniques. That was very fascinating to me. But I was just stepping back and saying, you know, in, in investing, for, for instance, you know, what distinguishes the, the good from the great? And it really is that they have better information. It really is that, you know, they have better spreadsheets or something like that. It's almost always that they're making better decisions, especially under stressful circumstances. And so that got me very interested in sort of learning more about all that stuff. And so, yeah, probably the late 1990s. And uh, that has been, you know, so that's been probably a 25 year journey and learning more about that stuff. And it, it, obviously, it's been a field that's really blossomed in the last quarter century as well. I mean, obviously, Conor Traversky, if you actually read the original stuff in the 1970s, it's remarkably lucid and interesting, even even from 50 years ago. But uh, but yeah, so probably the last 25 years. And and I've and, and obviously I've written some books about this and try to integrate it. Um, I, I just think it's an eternally fascinating thing. And, and as you said, like once you've learned some of these techniques, and, there, and some of the ideas are very accessible ideas. Once you've learned these techniques and in, integrated them and internalized them, I think it gives you a lot of um, a lot of help in sort of navigating through life and the decisions you make. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, two of your books, Think Twice and More Than You Know, are, are tre treasure shows and, and just underlined and highlighted uh, multiple times. So I'm a huge fan of your work there. Uh, I'm thinking about looking for an edge, and this doesn't only have to pertain to, to the investing world. This could just be life in general. But do you think behavioral mistakes – are where the most opportunity to find an edge is right now? Yeah, it's almost always, you know, we wrote a piece about this a little while ago about market inefficiencies. And I know you're talking about something broader and, and we talked about things that all of them probably do apply in life to some degree, but we talk about behavioral, analytical, informational, and, and technical. So analytical, I'll, I'll come back to behavioral last. Analytical just says you and I have the same information, but we analyze it differently. And and that is that can be that could be a, someone with better frameworks or mental models can have an edge in that regard. If you're competing with people, don't think about it as well. Um, and you could think about, by the way, e even like assessing athletes, for instance, that could be an example where, you know, we all have the same data on this particular athlete, but somehow you see something that others haven't seen. And that gives you an edge. Informationally means, you know, something others don't know. That's that happens. It's difficult to do, certainly in the context of markets. It's challenging. Um, technical, I'll leave aside, but <clears throat> but their technical shows up in everything, which is sometimes people make decisions for reasons that have nothing to do with what their actual preferences are. Um, and so, um, you know, I was talking actually to the G a GM of a NBA team, and the guy said, you know, I was talking about a particular trade, and he goes, well, you know, <clears throat> these guys had a salary cap problem, and you know, this this is he was just talking about all these moving pieces about things that had to do with the economics of the business rather than necessarily the values of the players. And he said, you know, we were able to fashion this trade that <clears throat> addressed these issues that had nothing to do really, or not nothing, but less to do with the actual player values. But if you go back and circle around, say behavioral stuff, I mean, that's the one that, um, you know, it's, it's unlikely that human nature is going to change anytime soon, even with all our understanding of these behavioral issues, 
people are people and um, <clears throat> you see it every day. So that I think those will be persistent. Um, you know, Ben Graham, who is obviously the father of security analysis, uh, had this metaphor of Mr. Market to think about markets. And in a sense, what he was trying to do is anthropomorphize this concept of um, markets as people and having these different sort of moods. And I think that I those sets of ideas will be around for, for a long time. So people will <clears throat> collectively become too optimistic or too pessimistic and, you know, collectively. And uh, that's always been true. And I think that is for the far, uh, far for the foreseeable future would also be true. So I think the behavioral stuff is, is huge. And, and that was a little bit of the point I think twice, which is say, hey, um, as you go through life, um, A, try to be better at it yourself. None of us will be perfect, but, you know, try to be better at it yourself. So you make fewer, for example, mistakes. But second is recognize that these mistakes are people are, are going to be made by others. And, and, you know, you may have an opportunity, I don't like to use the phrase, but to take advantage of or, or to, to take advantage of other people's mistakes, right, to some degree. So, so it's a dual benefit to understanding these things, A, being better yourself, but B, also seeing when other people are making mistakes that may be advantageous for you. Yeah, speaking of that dual benefit, I mean, I, I know you're a big fan of Daniel Kahneman's work, and I'm pretty sure that he said at some point that he's <coughs> studied all of these biases and, and he's no different for it. Do you have the same view or do you think these have been tremendous? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think that it's almost they're, – they're fairly universal. I think most of us have different proclivities to various things, but I think they're almost all universal. So I feel them all myself. And, you know, it's interesting even um, – all these little experiments that the, the psychologists give in classrooms to demonstrate these points. I did all those things going into them blind, got smoked by them every single time, you know? So it was, it was less, you know, not, you know, I, I certainly don't, so I don't hold myself above anybody on this stuff, but, but I do, I will say that. Um, and I think I recount this book, this story and think twice is that I went, there's a really wonderful uh, program at the Kennedy school at Harvard called investment decisions, and behavioral finance It's hosted by Richard Zeckhauser and Arnie Wood and, and, and Richard's been doing this thing for probably 30 years. <clears throat> and um, I went as an attendee in 2004 and Dick Thaler was there, won the Nobel Prize, you know, Dick, and he gave one of these overconfidence tests and then he did this thing called the two thirds game. So th these are two kind of common things. And uh, there were probably 70 people there and I won both of them. So I, I did better than 70 people in both of them, right? So one, you might say it was luck. Two would say it's probably unlikely that I was lucky twice in a row. And so, as I like to say, in full disclosure, I had done both of those exercises before and I had failed miserably, embarrassingly, <laughs> but I learned the lesson, right? So I learned how to deal with those two things. And as a consequence, every time I see that thing going forward, I will know how to deal with it, at, at least maybe not perfectly, but at least more perfectly than, than the average person. So it was not any sort of uh, brilliant insight on my part. It was more that I had learned the lesson. And that was precisely the point, right? Which is once you've learned these lessons, uh, hopefully on the margin, you can just make somewhat better decisions. And then those decisions add up to, to better outcomes, broader, better outcomes. I absolutely, I'm loving this. What other behavioral biases do you just find the most joy exploring? Well, I think that the, the, there are a couple ones that are really um, big ones in, in investing in particular. Um, but these are these are big deals in general. Um, one is called confirmation bias, which is once you've made a decision about something, you tend to seek information that confirms your view, and you dismiss, discount, or disavow information that doesn't confirm your view. And by the way, if it's information that's a jump ball, the jump ball always goes to you, right? <laughs> the tie always goes to the base runner. Um, and so that's a big one. And you know, how do you counter that? It would be things like uh, actively open mindedness, right? So this idea that really not only are you willing to entertain different points of view, but you seek them out. And that's cognitively challenging, by the way. It, it's taxing to some degree, but just keeping an open mind about everything. And, um, you know, so so just consider, and this goes back to even the things on negotiation. Wh what is the other person's point of view? <clears throat> the other big one in, in investing, but also probably in life, is this concept of overconfidence, that we tend to be, <clears throat> and, there, and there's certain, there's certain benefits to overconfidence and, and even optimism that sort of goes with it that are that are good and psychologically healthy. But but you want to be you don't want to be overconfident and you want to be underconfident. You want to be just well calibrated uh, as if possible. And, you know, you mentioned you brought up the really good point about feedback before. And you know, one of the questions is, are, are there ways to set up feedback mechanisms for yourself so that you get better calibrated in your decisions? 
and in your overconfidence over time. And I think there are ways to do that. Um, part of it is to, to think about the world probabilistically. And the second thing is to document how you're thinking about certain outcomes. And, you know, when I met Danny Kahneman for the first time, which was, which was just an absolute thrill, the first question I asked him was, what can I do to become a better decision maker? And his immediate response was, keep a journal of your important decisions. You know, write down what you expect to happen, why you expect it to happen, and assign probabilities to various outcomes. And then just keep that journal and refer back to it and score yourself on how things actually turn out. And sometimes you'll be right for the wrong reasons and you have to ding yourself right in those situations. And sometimes you'll be wrong for the right reasons. In other words, the 20% outcome happened, which is going to happen 20% of the time, right? One in every five cases. <clears throat> but I thought those things were really there and they're not super time consuming. They're not, super, they're not certainly not expensive, but they require a lot of discipline. And that, that could also be something that's also like athletics, which is sometimes, you know, discipline's a really important component is to make sure that you're, you're doing things properly every time, um, you know, if you're the, you're the receiver, you run your route properly every time at the right speed, you break the right spot and so on and so forth. So th those disciplines, another important thing that, that probably carries over to almost everything. Yeah. You were mentioning human nature is unlikely to change. I was laughing a minute ago when you brought up confirmation bias and, uh, the Greek statesman's Demosthenes, he had a great quote, what a man wishes, so shall he believe. Uh, so it holds true thousands of years later. So I, I'm pretty sure in a few thousand mm -hmm. years, they'll be looking back the same thing. You mentioned the decision journal really intrigued about that. That's, that's one I've kept as well. How much of this is just intuitive sixth sense for you at this point, And how much do you have to, to look to decision journals or other systematic ways to understand these? You know, Sean, the, the truth is I don't, I don't really make that many like business decisions since we're mostly doing research. Um, and, uh, but I have, obviously I work with in, in investment organizations. And so part of it is, uh, I think that, uh, I mean, for, so for me, I, you know, I, I hope that I'm able to think about most kinds of problems I bump into reasonably well, but I, I don't really have that many of these kinds of <clears throat> decisions where we're going to make money or lose money or whatever it is. But I will just say that I, I find that, um, you know, th there's a great quote from Barb Mellers at University of Pennsylvania. She said something like, you know, we find prediction very hard, but uh, rationalization of what happened very easy. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there's a big there's a lot of truth to that, which is that I think that most of us don't like to keep track of our, our decisions or keep track of, for example, investment decisions. You'd rather just let the chips fall where they are and then come up with a story to explain what happened. And by the way, that story tends to make you look pretty flattered in the whole outcome. So um, so I, I think it depends a lot on on the kinds of things you're doing. Um, I, I'll mention I was speaking with a, an executive, <clears throat> a senior executive for a major league baseball team the other day. And he was saying, like, you, he goes, this is actually something they struggle a lot with, which is how do they when they think about, for example, player assessment, how do they really know that they are thinking about things properly? And they're trying to work on documenting their decision-making process as they go along. And again, contrasting, for example, what the analytics department may say versus the scouts and so forth to see if they can glean you know, information from how they think about these kinds of problems. But part of it is, you know, can you quantify, for, for example, for an athlete, can you quantify measures of in quote success and, and and those kinds of things can be a little bit challenging but but i think the degree to which people are willing to, when they especially when you have things like discrete outcomes that we can agree upon and time periods that we can agree upon um that that kind of setup uh, it lends itself very much to giving quality feedback and i and, I, and by the way i think very few people do it and that's something i i would imagine uh, in the next 5 10 15 years that we'll see more of that and that will be good that's very helpful, also very insightful. Uh, I know we've got to wrap up here shortly. I, I'd love to spend a little bit of time on, on the Santa Fe Institute. And, I mean, it, it's unlikely you're going to gain insight if your inputs are identical to everyone else's. And that's one of the things that really fascinates me about the Santa Fe Institute. Could you explain just for, for a minute what the Santa Fe Institute is and then your role there? Sure. I mean, it was founded in the 1980s um, by a number of very eminent scientists who felt that academia had become very siloed. Um, so, you know, the physicists talk to physicists and the biologists to the biologists, but many of the vexing and important problems in the world lied at the intersection of disciplines. By the way, I, I was also deeply influenced by a book by E.O. Wilson in the late 1990s called uh, Consilience. And E.O. Wilson's probably the most famous uh, etymologist, uh, bug, bug guy. 
uh, ants in particular. And uh, consilience is this idea of the unification of knowledge. And, and what Wilson argued was, again, that we've made enormous strides through reductionism in the last few hundred years, but that much of our advancements in science would be, again, at the intersections of disciplines across disciplines. So the Santa Fe Institute was founded uh, to essentially bring together scientists to understand uh, vexing problems. The unifying theme is the study of evolving complex systems. I mentioned at the wisdom of crowds a few moments ago that the sort of cartoon version of a complex system would be an individual agent. So it could be a neuron in your brain or a person in the city or, or an investor in the stock market. Uh, they interact with other agents. So, uh, so there's interaction, which is really important. And they interact using decision rules about how they're going to approach things. And then what emerges from that is sort of a global system. So that could be consciousness or the performance of an ant colony or the performance of a city or obviously a market. And one of the key is that the, the characteristics, uh, the, the properties and characteristics of the, the, the market or the, the broad system, global system are different from the underlying agent. So it's a really interesting intellectual set of uh, conditions. So uh, yeah, so you go out there and it's incredibly intellectually intoxicating because it is self-selected for, for scientists and people who are uh, open-minded. Um, most of the scientists, in fact, I would say almost all of the scientists we have out there are eminent in their own field, but again, very open to different fields. So that's great. So the conversations are fascinating. And you know, I think some of the <clears throat> biggest ideas and understanding mar and the market is, a, is an incredible example. So almost maybe a canonical example of a complex system. And there've been other things out there that I found, yeah, I would call it wondrous, you know, like Jeffrey West and Jim Brown did some incredible work and Louis Betancourt, some great work on scaling and, and biological and social, social systems. Uh, in other words, there had been an, an empirical observation observed decades ago that these guys figured out exactly why it is the case, fascinating stuff. So yeah, it's just an incredible, it's an incredible organization. Um, I'm now chairman of the board. My, my term ends in the fall, but I've been chairman for the last seven and a half years, which has been a great honor. And we've got an incredible board of trustees um, as well. And uh, yeah, so, so it's, been, it's been a real pleasure to serve that, on that board and, and, and to, to interact with, with, our, with our scientists. And you know, for those that are interested, we have you know, some podcasts and so forth that are in some uh, some, um, yeah, well, podcasts are probably the best way to do it that, that will allow people to be initiated with some of the concepts and, and again, super fun. Yeah, absolutely. A huge fan there. We've, we've been fortunate enough to have Brian A. Arthur on as well, uh, talking about complexity. So he, he's someone I, I admire greatly. I know you do as well. As we wrap up here, are there any big projects you're, you're currently working on or even something that's really just fascinating you right now? Yeah, I'll mention two things. Um, one, one, one piece we're working on is um, <clears throat> taking a multi-decade look at the evolution from public markets and equities to private markets and equities in the United States. So in other words, there are fewer, there are half as many public companies today as there were 25 years ago. And uh, there's been a huge rise in the buyout industry and to a lesser degree, the venture capital industry. So we're looking at uh, doing a really deep dive on those, those, the, that trend and why it's happened and so forth. And that's been fascinating. You mentioned Brian Arthur, who we cite in that paper and, and, and others, Paul Romer, who won the Nobel Prize. So there's, there's a ton of stuff in there. So that's a fascinating one. Sean, the other one I'm, I'm interested in a lot is, <clears throat> and these are, these are interesting because these are like slow moving trends, but they accumulate to be very profound over time is that, um, in, in, in companies, and we'll just pick the United States, stay in the United States for a moment, but companies, uh, they, they used to invest primarily in physical assets, right? So think about factories and stores and warehouses and all that kind of stuff, inventory. And increasingly, investments that companies are making are uh, intangible, right? So things like um, customers and marketing and you know, so forth. And where they show up on the financial statements is in different spots. So there's been, I'm going to call it a distortion because it's not really, it's, it's all, you know, acceptable accounting. But, but I think that the way people have to think about economic value from the financial statements has evolved in the last 30 or 40 years in such a way that, um, that you know, it, it, it compels people to think about things, I think, more progressively. So we're spending a lot of time now helping, hopefully, writing about this idea of, 
of the rise of intangibles and how one might think about that from an accounting point of view so as to get a better sense of, of that, the value of businesses and the value creation prospects of businesses. So that's another area uh, that's fascinating. I'll mention a third one. <clears throat> you used a really fascinating phrase, explore versus exploit. So I don't know if any listeners caught that, but but that's another area I've always been very interested in. And I think that as, as a business, you could think about, you know, sort of exploitation as doing more of what we do now, which is obviously completely fine. But exploration is trying to go out and find something new, find the next big thing. And it's really interesting to ask from a resource allocation point of view, how much should I allocate to exploitation and how much should I allocate to exploration? And if you look at nature, by the way, what's interesting is in environments that don't change much, the skew towards exploitation and there's very little exploration. Why? Because exploration is not that valuable because stuff doesn't change, right? By contrast, in rapidly changing environments, and you could think about ecosystems, for example, rapidly changing environments, there is a much greater premium put on exploration and less on exploitation because what you're exploiting is going to go away and you need to figure out what's going to be next. So I'd love to think about a way to codify that to some degree, even in a corporate setting, are the ways that we can think about measuring rate of change in the environment. And as a consequence, ways of thinking about maybe not optimal, but at least directionally correct uh, allocations of exploitation exploitation versus exploration. So to me, that's another area that you know, we're playing around. There's some new books out on this, but but that that's another area that I'd like to, to, to do a deeper dive into. To say my antennas are up right now with all three of those would just be an absolute understatement. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to diving into that. I just have two final ones. I know you've already mentioned a ton of books. Uh, we have a lot of young listeners as well, recent college grads. If you're going to gift five books to a recent college grad right now, what do you think would be incredibly helpful? Oh, geez, five is a lot. Um, well, you're, you're, sitting, you're sitting in front of what appears to be thousands of your unbelievable library. Yeah, yeah that's true. That is true. Um, but I'll say that um, that uh, a lot of it depends on the flavor. So, so it depends on what someone's interested in. But I'll mention, I'll just mention three core ones. So historically, when we've had interns, college student interns work with us at the end of, at the, end of the internship, I usually give three books to those interns. Um, the first is Steven Pinker's How the Mind Works. That book is one of his older books, but I still think an, a really interesting book and in particular chapter five is, is fantastic. The second is the book I just mentioned a few moments ago, Consilience by E.O. Wilson. Again, the, the idea to try to get people to think about um, the intersections of disciplines. And the third one is um, a little bit off the beaten path, but it's the, called, a book called The Metaphysical Club by Lewis Menand. And The Metaphysical Physical Club is a history of the uh, philosophy of pragmatism in the United States. So it actually traces the, the, the philosophical tradition of pragmatism. So it's a, it's a very, Manan's a wonderful writer and is a very interesting um, walk through, through pragmatism. Um, it would be really hard if someone's interested in psychology, it'd be really hard for me not to recommend Thinking Fast and Slow by Danny Kahneman. Obviously, I think, just think that's a, that's a really wonderful book. And then, um, the, you know, a more recent one that I really like from an author who I love is, is uh, Range by David Epstein. So David wrote his first book I read that I loved was called The Sports Gene. And, and as, as that very much like it sounds, it talks about the, the role of genetics and sports performance. Super interesting topic, and, and there's much more to go on that. Um, Range is his latest book, which is, which is also fantastic, and speaks to uh, the um, balance between generalists and specialists. So in life, do you want to be a specialist or do you want to be a generalist? You know, in chapter one, he contrasts Tiger Woods, who is sort of the canonical specialist versus Ro uh, Roger Federer, who actually defined himself as a tennis player quite late for relatively speaking, and was actually very active in other sports. And, and I suspect, Sean, you're probably in my camp as well, that I think <clears throat> young people, high, high school athletes in particular, to the degree to which is possible, I really recommend that they play multiple sports because I think it's a really healthy thing and I actually think it makes you better in your core sport. It, it actually may uh, slow down your improvement in your core sport a tiny bit, but I think that, that David and others have given a lot of evidence to show that in the long run, you do much better being uh, in different sports. So those, those, maybe those would be my five. Um, but again, 
And and what I'll do, Sean, is I'll send you. I don't know if you you can. I don't know if you have the capability to post it, but I'll send you a reading list that I share with people. And so that and that's broken up into different sections. And so a little bit is, hey, what what's you know what are you excited about now? What's what what is uh, what suits your taste? And then you sort of flip through and see if there's anything that. Uh, that tickles your fancy. That would be tremendously beneficial. And I, I have to highlight the three books of yours that I've read. We didn't even really talk about any of them, uh, but I certainly want the listeners picking them up. The Success Equation, Think Twice, and then More Than You Know. Uh, th- these are books that sit on my shelf, and I love the final one, Michael. I, I really cannot thank you enough for this time. This has been tremendously helpful. But if you were going to sit down, you were going to be holding the microphone, get to spend an evening with anyone dead or alive, not a family member or friend, who would you spend the evening interviewing? Oh, I don't know. That's a really interesting one, um, especially if you say de- dead or alive. Um, you know, there there are some people. I mean, the, the guy who I probably admire the I don't know if this is my would be my ultimate answer because you'd probably think about like very famous figures, but the guy who I admire deeply, deeply is Charles Darwin. I don't know if he'd be an interesting guy to hang out with for an evening. He might be boring to hang out with an evening, but but I but I, I, I've always been very taken with the idea of evolution, and um, I've always been amazed by his temperament and his uh, work process and so forth. So maybe I would pick Charles Darwin. He's my hero and uh, intellectual hero, and uh, so that I'll, I'll go with that one. Yeah, I found myself rereading his autobiography uh, the other day. So huge fan as well. Michael, I, I mentioned this a minute ago. This has just been so impactful. The the number of years I've been looking forward to this conversation. We didn't even get to, to hit the tip of the iceberg in terms of what I would love to talk with you at some point. But where do you want the listeners staying connected with you? I know you've got some unbelievable uh, information out there on the webs. Anywhere you want them going? Yeah, I mean, I think that the main way to sort of keep up a little bit, you know, you can follow my at Twitter. I'm at my handle is MJ Mobison um, is my Twitter handle. And I have a website, michaelmobison.com. So there's some stuff on the books. You mentioned some of the books. Thank, thank you for doing that. But the, some, of the, some of the highlights of the books and free chapters, if people are interested in checking those out, would be at michaelmobison.com. Those Great. would be two Twitter right. handles on the, on the website. Yep. We'll have everything linked up in the show notes. But once again, Michael, I cannot thank you enough for joining us on What Got You There. My pleasure, Sean. Thank you. You guys made it to the end of another episode of What Got You There. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I really do appreciate you taking the time to listen all the way through. If you found value in this, the best way you can support the show is giving us a review, rating it, sharing it with your friends, and also sharing on social. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Looking forward to you guys listening to another episode.